Welcome to the Sessor Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name's Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and we're excited to have with us today Kevin and Sherry Harney. The Harneys are the co-founders of Organic Outreach International, a ministry that helps Christians share the good news of Jesus in natural ways. Kevin's the lead pastor of Shoreline Church in Monterey, California, and Sherry serves as the spiritual formation and discipleship director. And today we'll discuss their new book, Organic Disciples, Seven Ways to Grow Spiritually and Naturally Share Jesus. But before we do that, let's hear from Ed Setzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Executive Director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Hey, thank you, and good conversation we're going to have today because these are dear friends of uh, many years, common passion for showing and sharing the love of Jesus, seeing people changed by the power of the gospel, and now they've co-authored Organic Disciples. And um, here's the thing. I, I, was, I was recently at the Barna State of Your Church event, the national broadcast thing, and um, one of the things he said and what just really stuck with me is that um, one of the things we learned in the last couple of years is he said, and he said, let me use a phrase that you might have heard in high school or something, uh, when it comes to church members and their pastors and leaders, because it was, it was geared towards pastors, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was in that context. He says, they're just not that into you. And I think ultimately mm -hmm. one of the things we saw, I, I, mean, I just left a meeting of pastors, and one of the things they said in the last few years, we saw how shallow our discipleship was, how people were mm -hmm. swept up and swept away by the currents of the day. So I'm super excited about this book uh, from, from Dear Friends. Um, so let's talk some first about this. Discipleship's, oh gosh, it's a bit of a buzzword in the Christian community, which, right. which maybe we want more of it, not less of it. But what would you say that our typical understanding of discipleship is, and why do you put an emphasis on discipleship being organic? Well, it's interesting, different people perceive discipleship different ways, and it, it tends to go from one end of the continuum of, the word means nothing. You know, I'm a Christian, so I'm a disciple, but people haven't thought through what does that mean? How do, how do we know we're a disciple, growing as a disciple? And then there's the other end. I ran into somebody not long ago who asked me, does your church do discipleship? And I, I, I said, well, yeah, we do this to grow children and this to grow youth and this for adults. He goes, yeah, but do you do discipleship? I said, well, yeah, we do this and this. He goes, yeah, but do you do discipleship? And I finally realized, oh my gosh, he's got this narrow view of, and it was sort of this one-on-one, -on -one, almost overbearing, this person runs the life of the other person. And I said, well, I said, we do it a thousand different ways. We understand discipleship to be anytime a person takes the hand of another person and helps them grow spiritually to move towards Jesus. I believe you can be discipling someone toward Jesus. This is the Matthew 28 call to make disciples before they know Jesus, and then once they do know Jesus, continue to grow in faith, and then we teach them how to do the same with other people. So it's that journey of becoming more like Jesus in community with other people. That's a, a very quick uh, you know, definition that you could dig into if you'd like to. Well, and I've, I've really found being the spiritual formation and discipleship director at my church that there are still a lot of people who uh, limit it to a one-on-one -on -one experience where you're um, coming with an idea of studying the Bible, praying together, and somehow, if you're not doing that, you're not really being discipled. And so that, that's that been interesting because we understand it as just following Jesus, becoming more like Christ, living the life that he lived, you know, thinking the way that he think, thought. And, um, and so it's so much bigger uh, than what so many people have um, reduced it to. Yeah, yeah I, I guess, um, again, if people haven't necessarily read Organic Disciples, they wouldn't know how you walk through that, and I want to encourage people to. Um, but I mean, that description can almost sounds like all the activities of the church are discipleship. Um, yet, you know, when someone says they've been discipled, it usually means they've met with somebody, I don't know, 13 weeks, a year, one on one. So, what's the mix between the organic nature of this in community and the intentional nature of this in spiritual formation? I mean, Terry, this your. I mean, you're literally your title at church. I'm, I'm the dean over the Christian Formation and Ministry Wheaton College. And we would both see organic and intentional as part of it. How do those mix together? Yeah, well, the you know, part of the intentional aspect is for many people, if you say what's discipleship, they would say, I spend time with Jesus. I'm growing in my faith interpersonally. We see it as uh, the structural part is actually life to life to life. The reality is that every person who knows Jesus now was influenced by somebody who took their hand, whether it was a grandparent or a parent who maybe spent 
decades pouring into the life of a grandchild or a child? You know, does that does that count as discipleship? If you had a godly father or mother who walked with you daily, I'd say absolutely. Uh, and, and, and then you might have somebody who formally in the church takes your hand and walks with you for a season. And so we actually paint this picture of, of hands locked with hands. So I've got two people right now who formally disciple me, a guy named Paul Cedar and a guy named Carl Overbeek. They formally meet with me monthly and they pour into my life. But I also have a few dozen other people who I learn from and who influence me spiritually consistently. And so there's the formal, and then there's just the kind of walking through life. And I, we think that both of those are meaningful and important, but I think we all need to be having people that we can say, they take my hand and help me grow. And then there's other people whose hand I take and help them grow. And I teach them to do that with another generation until Jesus returns, we keep passing on that legacy. And, and we found that it's kind of interesting. And I write a lot about this in the book from my own life, since I was raised in a Christian home that um, people don't count it as discipleship when we're thinking about our parents and how they led us. And now maybe as we have kids and how we're raising them and discipling them, that that actually counts as discipleship within the, the family. And in fact, in this day and age, we, we've got to get a hold of that, that this is one of the most important places that we're going to be discipling and helping the next generations to grow, to be more like Jesus and to take that serious and that it actually counts. It counts. So my yeah, parents discipling counts. me, me discipling the children, yeah. the children, my children discipling their grandchildren, that four generations of discipleship. That family generational, uh, you know, framework, I think that that's really helpful to understand both the intentionality and the, the organic aspect. Uh, you know, so much of your ministry with um, organic outreach is, you know, evangelism and uh, sh sharing the gospel. So love to hear uh, you unpack, you know, what was the heartbeat behind writing a book that was still about evangelism, but, you know, primarily around discipleship? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's a great question because we've spent almost 40 years as a couple creating evangelism resources and free stuff online to give away, writing books, training leaders all around the world. And that's been our consuming passion. And we've actually kind of said through the years, we've said other people do discipleship. They do it really well. We see evangelism and discipleship as locked together, but there's so much discipleship stuff out there. We're like, we don't need to wander into that world, we're going to focus on evangelism. And that's how we actually became friends with Ed through kind of living in that world and have connected with wonderful people who have that same passion. But what we started to realize was that there were a lot of people who kind of thought, well, if I grow as a disciple, then I'll just naturally do evangelism. If we grow people to spiritual maturity, they'll just share their faith. And actually sitting at a lunch, and one of the, one of the motivating factors of us writing this book was sitting at, it was a lunch or a dinner with Ed in Wheaton mm -hmm. before the first Amplify conference. And I said, Ed, I'm going to be speaking at the conference. And one of the things I'm going to say, and a bunch of people started tweeting this around. I said, one of the things I'm going to say is some people think that if we just grow people up as disciples, they'll just naturally start sharing their faith. Mm -hmm. And I said, all evidence to the contrary. And I said, Ed, can I say that? And he says, oh, yes. He said, you know, <laughs> we have all these great movements. They grow people towards more Bible studies, more learning. But are they moving people out with the gospel? And so it was that what that was one of the moments, kind of catalytic moments where I said, Maybe the Lord's calling us to take a next step and dig into this time and connect that organic outreach with discipleship. So, Ed, thank you for a free dinner and thank you for <laughs> your encouragement. Well, you bought me dinner last time. So, I think that's a place that's you got. Are you going to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that it, um, and the simplicity of going back to the simplicity of following Jesus and um, being a disciple of Jesus means that we share about his message. You can't. Yeah. You can't separate the two. I mean, Jesus' mission statement is Luke 19, uh, 10, you know, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So if we're going to be disciples, if we're going to be a true disciple, then that has to be our mission as well. Yeah. And so kind of going back just to the basics, that somehow along the, the way we've lost the basic foundation of what true discipleship really is, that ultimately it has to end up where we're sharing about his love with the world. That's true yeah. discipleship. Yeah. yeah, I feel a little betrayed by by you and both of you in this. And let me tell you why. Tell, tell us about because, that, Ed. <laughs> yes, I, it's, I just want to work through this with you. Um, because one of the things that we said is that in when the rest of the world got focused on other things, we were going to be the people who were talking about showing and sharing the love of Jesus. We were going to be the people yeah. doing evangelism. One of the things that sort of happened in the last 
I, I don't know. I think it, it's in some ways it's related to the Billy Graham, Dawson Trotman sort of timeline that uh, evangelism became a lane. And mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of people abandoned that lane. We all saw that. So we're evangelism okay. is something people almost like to make fun of rather than to do. So evangelism became a lane and everyone left that lane. Discipleship became a robust lane. And but I think one of the things that we forget is and, and again, you may phrase it differently, but I think disciple making discipleship is someone who doesn't know Jesus. The first step of discipleship or disciple making is that for us to share the gospel with them. So yes. pre conversion, disciple making yes. is evangelism and post conversion disciple right. making. We tend to have a category of discipleship. So let me say I, I, I'm not really feeling betrayed, but I think it's a beautiful <laughs> merger of these realities yeah. that we seem to have separated. We seem to have bifurcated. Totally. And so what, so, but how, this is the way, I mean, even in church, there's an evangelism person and organic yeah. outreach. But those, you know, again, I get, when I was at Moody Church as the interim, um, I, I, brought, I brought Kevin in to preach because we really found super helpful the ideas of organic outreach, which are still reflected in organic disciples. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind, take a moment and talk with me and explain to people who may not know about organic, uh, organic outreach. And then I'm going to follow up with that and ask how you link, link those things together. But, but walk about organic outreach, talk about some of the degrees, talk about how as a church, we can build our passion for outreach and evangelism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what Sherry and I have done is, is we've really tried to answer that exact question. How do you move people who love Jesus and know Jesus out with the gospel? That's the call of every believer to reach lost people, to walk with them towards Jesus and to keep walking with them with Jesus. Right. And so we ended up uh, focusing on families and we said, okay, organic outreach for families, turning your home into a lighthouse. How do you reach your own children? How do you reach your community with your children with, as a family? That, that was kind of a part of what we focused on. That's organic outreach in a family context because we live that out right there. And then organic outreach for ordinary people was a focus on my personal journey in my workplace and my school, wherever I am, how do I shine the light of Jesus and do it? And then the really fascinating one was organic outreach for churches mm -hmm. How do we change the culture of a church? Every church I talk to that believes the Bible still that believes in Jesus would say, oh, we want to reach our community with the gospel. We're, we're committed to it. You say, well, how are you doing that? Crickets. Right. Well, we send money to missionaries or we do a couple right. programs. So how do you change the whole culture? So what we've been grabbing, organic outreach uh, is really about how do you, wherever you are in your home, in your workplace, in the church, in your personal life, how do you shine the light of Jesus in a way that's not like a spotlight in someone's eyes that blinds them, but with like a, a gentle flame that draws people toward Jesus? And so we spent about 35 years uh, in that lane, Ed, with feeling very lonely till we met other people who are in that lane too. But, but we've spent years figuring out how do you do that in very organic, natural ways, not this pushy, overbearing, scary way, but in a way that doesn't freak other people out and doesn't even freak us out. And here's the, here's the key there, Ed, uh, that you know more than 90% of Christians would probably say, I get nervous about sharing my faith. I get nervous about talking about Jesus. Everything that we've tried to do is for those 90 to 95% of Christians who say, I love lost people. I believe they need Jesus. I want to be part of God's solution, but I'm scared. Hey, let's find natural ways where you can do this as part of your life. And when people get a hold of that, oh, the joy it brings, the excitement, because you know, and I know, we all know that any Christian can share their faith if they can do it in a way out of how God's made them. That's kind of the heartbeat of it. It's just living the kind of life that um, naturally draws people to Jesus. Yeah. And it's speaking yeah. the kinds you know, of words that people use in ordinary language. It's yeah. when someone has a problem um, and we believe in the power of prayer, we believe that we let them know, hey, um, I care about you and I do believe in the power of prayer. May I pray for you? Um, I. I have opportunities all the time to pray with people who aren't Christians. Yeah. Once I listen to their their story, and then ask politely if I can pray for them, I, yeah. it happens all the time. Yeah. A lot of our listeners are are pastors or they lead churches, and I, I'm going to give you a dynamic and just want you to speak to this dynamic. So sometimes, uh, you know, a pastor's uh, church membership, they'll have those who are considered like evangelists and they're very passionate about sharing the gospel. And then you have a group of those who are a little bit more maybe discipleship oriented and they want to see people grow. But sometimes the evangelists don't see themselves as primarily a disciple maker and then vice versa. Right. Disciple makers don't see themselves as evangelists. Um, can you help pastors and leaders navigate like um, that dynamic? You know, so do you try to 
turn evangelists into disciple makers and then vice versa? Or do you help them come up with something, you know, uh, uniquely that's, uh, you know, to the church? I mean, help navigate through some of that. Yeah. So I would start by saying yes to everything you just said. It, it, it's not a it's not an either or or one or the other, right? It's 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 very dynamic. But I, but what we've learned is this, that most Christians are more comfortable starting with the idea of discipleship. We were done writing books on outreach when we finished these three this trilogy of outreach books, and then out of conversations with people like Ed, training some leaders in New Zealand who said. Someone needs to help connect the dots. The exact question you're asking right now, Daniel, how do you connect the dots between discipleship and evangelism in a meaningful way that people say, okay, I get it. Or, or even like a Trojan horse to kind of kind of sneak it in where they don't really see what's coming. Hey, we're going to talk about discipleship. And all of a sudden they go, wait a minute, this is evangelism. And you go, well, yes, because they're marriage partners, they're bound together. And so what we realized is, is if you are, if people say I'm walking closely, I'm a disciple, I'm walking closely with Jesus. Here's the simple picture that, that we've talked about together, Sherry and I, through the years, and, and that is that if somebody's walking closely with Jesus, it's, it's like a child holding the hand of a parent. Well, where does that child go? Everywhere the parent goes, sure. because they're being led. Well, if you're holding the hand of Jesus and walking close with him as a disciple following Jesus, here's the question, where does Jesus go? He's always going to the lost, to the broken, to the sheep that are wandering. Mm -hmm. his, his heart breaks for them. So if we're actually growing as disciples and we look in the mirror and we're not drawing near lost people with the heart of Jesus, then let me dare to say this, then we're not really growing that deep as a disciple sure. because we're not following Jesus and going where he goes. And so in organic disciples, all we're really doing is we're saying, we look at each aspect of discipleship, growing in the word, growing in prayer, growing in worship, all these things that we love to do as Christians. And, oh, we love that. But all of those things if we follow Jesus closely into the word, into prayer, into worship, into generosity, we end up at the world with Jesus. We end up becoming those who reach the lost. We, we try to bind them together. So pastors, leaders, um, you can disciple your people as long as you understand that a disciple moves toward the lost because we move with Jesus and he's always going there. And we're just trying to connect those dots. Does, does that help make sense of that? And I don't know if it does. Sure wants to add to I, that, but yeah, I would add that um, there's a, famous meme that with Ron Burgundy, and he says, I don't believe you. Uh, so let me let me explain, because um, I agree theoretically with what you say. But one of the things that if I could be nice to you is in Organic Disciples, uh, Seven Ways to Grow Spiritually and Naturally Share Jesus, is you put a link together. My experience, maybe yours is different. My experience is, is that sometimes the more we see people discipled, the less helpful they become in evangelism. Yes, yes, so you're, yes. you're saying, you're describing it as naturally, but I think in a sense you're giving us a natural correction in organic yes. disciples. So am I, yeah, am I, you didn't need to write the book if it just naturally happened. So, so what mm -hmm. is, again, Ron Burgundy, I don't believe you. Um, so how can we actually, to use your term, grow spiritually and naturally share Jesus? What are some of those? seven ways. Walk us through some of that, because I don't think it happens as much as I'd like it to. I don't think it happens as much as you'd like it to, or you wouldn't have written the book. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we have seven markers of spiritual growth, and um, it's Bible engagement, oops, passionate prayer, wholehearted worship, humble service, joyful generosity, consistent community, and then we call it organic outreach. But one of the things, and Ed, I think this is what you're um, talking about, is that when a Christian is spending time in the word, if it's just for them, their time in the word isn't having the impact that the Lord desires in their life. And if a person is praying and it's all about them and, and their family, but the prayer, their prayer life doesn't extend them out into the world, then we have cut short of what Jesus example is in the gospels as we study as we study his life as kevin said what was the heart of jesus he's always going for the broken the lost and so we have to make sure that these these practices um that we're engaging in that they're not just for us if they're just for us um the lord can just take us up to heaven now we, you know i mean um 
there's no purpose for us. We're here for a purpose and that's to share his love with those who do not yet know him. Yeah. And so hopefully our desire is as each person looks at what we're talking about with biblical engagement and passionate prayer that um, they get a much bigger picture um, as they're engaging and growing in these practices. It's not just about them. Yeah. It's how does this propel you out into the world yeah. with the message of Jesus? Yeah. Okay. Now yeah, I, I, I would, I, if, but let me, somebody, let me ask you, Kevin, follow up. So I believe you, I am with you. So if we're, on, if we're aligned that that should happen, how do we help it happen? And that's key for those of you who haven't read, I want to encourage you to read uh, Organic Disciples, but how do we help that to happen? Because it seems to me that too often when people grow in the Lord, they walk away from their unchurched yes. friends and more. So how do we yeah. make that happen? Give us some examples. Yeah, so first I want to ask your listeners, somebody create a meme with Ron Burgundy saying, I don't believe you, and right next to his head steps are saying, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, exactly. There you go. Um, so, so let me give you an example. And so, what we do in the book, and it was really kind of interesting as we and we write together. Literally, we go back and forth, back and forth, probably twenty five times with everything we write. And we we love being a team. We've done this for pushing toward four decades. And so, since we were like nine or ten years old, apparently. But, um, but what we do in the book is with each of the markers of growth. If you say, okay, prayer is a marker of our spiritual growth. If you ask most Christians, how do you know you're growing as a Christian? One of the things that well, you're growing in prayer. So we have a, a whole chapter that's just, how did Jesus pray? And we just study the life of Jesus because if we're disciples of Jesus, we're becoming like him. So we just dig into really ex an expository look at the prayer life of Jesus from the gospels. The next chapter is, how do you pray like Jesus? So it gives tools and ways to pray like Jesus. That's where we normally stop, okay? The next chapter is, how does praying like Jesus take you to the world with the gospel? Love it, love it. We don't leave a, a misty sort of a, now you figure it out. We talk about how do you pray with non-believers? How do you pray? I, I prayed one time with an atheistic woman who was a, she was a communistic, humanistic atheist who ran a camp to keep young people from becoming Christians. And when I asked her, could I pray for you? She said, would you do that for me? And we had a glorious time. And, and, and so, so what we do is we go past just to, here's the example of Jesus. Here's how, we do, here's how we live like Jesus. But then we say, how do you then take that into the world? How does generosity take you to the world? How does prayer take you to the world? How do the scriptures take you to the world? And for some reason, most Christians don't connect those dots unless we help them. That's what we're kind of humbly, clearly trying to say, here's how we connect you to the, trust me, if you aren't moving to the world, you, you don't fully understand worship. Because worship of God takes you into his presence, and his presence is where everyone needs to be. And so we connect those dots. I, I, I think that that's probably the, now I, we can break down some specific ways we connect the dots, but that's the that's the methodology that we use to take people all the way to the world. Yeah, yeah. Sherry, let me, let me ask you, because you mentioned this earlier, and this is coming off of what Kevin is just saying. You, you, you talked about uh, four generations of disciples, yeah. and mm -hmm. I think you, you actually write about this in the book as well. And that family framework is a helpful um, picture for an organic structure. So making disciples through family lineage. Speak to pastors and church leaders as they're looking to develop structures in the church. You know, what's the difference between, you know, really capitalizing on organic structures like family and then over programming discipleship? It, does that make sense? Because uh, there are some organic structures like family are there other kinds of organic structures that you can capitalize on uh, to use for discipleship because i think most people have fallen into the rut that discipleship is something that you over program does that make sense so yes, love for you to yes. share some ideas and speak to that yeah and i so i do think that the family is the best place for that to happen mm -hmm. because those are the people we spend the most time with and to take advantage of that it's kind of interesting um we'll talk with people uh, I'll talk with people one on one and um, talking to them about how they are reaching out and they'll say, oh, I, uh, I really don't have time right now. I'm with my grandkids so much. I really don't have time to reach out to into the world. And I, I say, stop. Wait a minute. You're with your grandchildren. This is one of the best places for you to be doing this. And what I have found is that a lot of people just aren't registering the, the place they have in the family. Yeah taking advantage of that we don't you know we're getting away from family time um, with all our technology and so i think that's one of the places that the church has to address right now get back to having dinners together where 
there's open time and, and, and playing together more yeah. so that those opportunities can happen. And, um, and I, I'd love to jump in because I want Sherry to speak to something specifically. Daniel, you're asking about um, structurally, programmatically, are there ways that we can not over-program but connect lives? And one of the things that Sherry has done at Shoreline is she set up, uh, she's created three assessment tools around around spiritual gifting, around spiritual pathways of growth, and around the markers of our spiritual maturity. And she set up a way that people can do an assessment and then meet one-on-one -on -one with somebody who helps design a pathway for them. And so I'd yeah. love to tell about well, what you do with that. And I was, is, I was gonna share that because yeah. I do find that a lot of people are taking advantage of that setup in our church where they can take a personal assessment and then they can choose to meet one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. with a church leader. And we do have people taking advantage of that opportunity. It feels a little bit less threatening. It's just one-on-one. -on -one. We always remind people when we come in for the one-on-ones, I remind them, this was your assessment of yourself. We're not assessing you. Yeah. And make people feel comfortable about having somebody spend time helping them to grow, to become more like Jesus. Many of them have never done this before where somebody's spoken into their spiritual life and she creates a first experience, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's really interesting because there's so many people who don't have any experience even with the Bible and these one-on-ones provide an opportunity to help them to grow in some very basic uh, ways to grow. So that has yeah. been um, yeah. something that we've done in our church, yeah. just kind of those one-on-ones, not, uh, not so formal, but hey, let's just grow and how can we help you? Yeah, and, and all those resources she's created, we give away online for free. And so she, she, even a training of how to do it. So, but, but Daniel, I've watched Sherry. She had me do one of those one-on-ones, but we've got a whole team that she's trained to do this in the church. Every one of those first kind of chance to be mentored by somebody, discipled, uh, whatever term you want to use, it is dynamic. And those people go to deeper places in their own spiritual life. And then ultimately deeper places into the world with the gospel because they've had somebody take their hand and walk with them. And so that's something that Sherry has designed and literally anyone in our church can do it. And somebody got online not long ago and reached out to Shoreline Church from Texas to the wrong Shoreline Church. And Sherry and her team took them through the same process, even though we're not their Shoreline she, Church. She thought so. I worked at the Shoreline in Texas, but I still had an hour meeting with her. And actually, sure. it was beautiful. She was, yeah. a, she was a refugee yeah. from Africa. I just had an amazing time with her and uh, connected her back with her church. Yeah. Um, but anybody Love can that. use our assessment, um, particularly for the, the markers of, of, of spiritual growth. Uh, you can go to our, our website, Organic Disciples, and anybody can take That's that great. assessment. Yeah. So, so let me follow up on that because I, I mean, what you just talked about, you know, the, the, the process that you develop for uh, leaders in your church to walk others through. I mean, to me that, that creates another um, layer of uh, like staff. Like, do you look at staff differently now uh, when you think about organic discipleship? Because I think for a lot of churches, it's the pastoral staff that does the disciple making. They do the discipleship. But what I'm hearing yeah. you saying is, that, I mean, this drastically changes the culture of your pastoral staff if organic discipleship is actually something that's pervasive throughout the church. Can you, can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is kind of interesting because we encouraged all of our staff to take this assessment. And um, one of our leaders who does stuff with um, technology here, and um, she has a few people working with her, she ended up on her own just having them take the assessment and she met with them one-on-one. -on -one. And without me even training her, she actually discipled them and just on her own. And I love that. So yes, very much um, the, the, the staff has um, does have a sense that they're a part of this too. This isn't just something I'm doing as the spiritual formation discipleship director. And also Sherry is training lay people to yeah, have I gifting have for it. People. She has lay people trained to walk with lay people and pour into their lives. And sometimes those initial encounters become an ongoing relationship and an ongoing uh, spiritual friendship or an ongoing discipling process. And so, um, yeah, that that's become a very dynamic uh, tool that ch churches are using and finding that, boy, we can connect people who might not, you know, just to walk up to somebody and say, will you disciple me? The two men that are discipling, you know, I went to them and asked them, would you pour into my life? They prayed about it and said, yes, but how many people have the courage to go to someone and say, excuse me, I need to grow spiritually. Will you help me? But we build that we connect those bridges. And then once you do that, people will just begin to move and, and grow. Yeah. And then, Daniel, one of the things that we do in this experience is we meet with them and then we just do a follow-up meeting. And then 
they determine how much longer they want to spend with us. But sometimes those initial meetings get them, we, we find and in those meetings, a lot of them end up with them finding places to serve, yeah. just the conversations that happen. It, it's been amazing to see the fruit that has come from just those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yeah. yeah, I'm particularly um, intrigued, uh, interested in how you also connect. And I want to come back to this as we're coming near the end of the podcast, uh, how you connect these things back to what I know is your lifelong passion. Um, and those of you who haven't been to, like, so Shoreline, I've had the privilege of, of preaching there, doing a conference there. It's a uniquely, it's a unique place. It's a uniquely passionate place about mission and evangelism and, and discipleship. So I knew that was already there, but for a lot of people, again, we're back to that bifurcated reality. So how do you, how does growing in discipleship give us some ways that helps us and leads us to overcome our fears in sharing the gospel? You've already kind of shared some walking towards Jesus. I liked your picture of the parent with the child, but give us some examples, some ways that this leads to that, not leads us away from people who don't know the Lord, but leads us to them and points them to Jesus. Yeah, so so part of what we do, and, and so so you're kind of connecting us back to organic disciples and organic outreach, and, and, and we, we describe evangelism discipleship as marriage partners, not enemies. They really, are, they're bound together, right? And so as we, uh, as we invest in our staff, and also I should say all of our volunteer leaders, we're pouring into them, grow spiritually, and your growth spiritually takes you out the road with the gospel. So we actually, and this is going to, for, for some of your listeners, this will seem uh, like almost too much, but I believe this is what's necessary. We infuse discipleship and evangelistic passion and movement into all of our leaders every 30 days until Jesus returns. Every 30 days. We infuse inspiration. We fire them up. Accountability. Are you living it out? Learning. Here's some new tools. And planning. What are you going to do next? We actually created a seven-year curriculum that's used. Sherry uses it with her with her team. I use it with my church board. All of my church board members are volunteers. But every 30 days, I'm infusing discipleship vision and an evangelism vision into every one of our board members every 30 days till Jesus returns. And let me tell you something. They love it. Awesome. I was told when I started doing this by a couple of leaders, if you do this, some of your board members will quit. And I said, well, if I'm going to call them to evangelism, they quit. I don't want them on the board. But can I tell you guys something? None of them quit. One by one, they came to me privately and said, thank you. You don't know how much I've been longing to do this, but I've never had the courage or the equipping or the impassioning to do it. And they are now living it out in their lives. And so, Ed, to your question, we infuse the discipleship value, but we use specific outreach practices and attitudes every 30 days. And after our seven-year career, and I take, I take our board and our senior staff through that curriculum every 30 days. When we finish the seven years, all we do is we start over again. And I've been here now for 13 years because after two weeks, they forget stuff. But after seven years, it's all fresh and new again. So we've created a perpetual tool for infusing outreach. And it's that important and that necessary. And that material is available to anyone on our organicoutreach.org. And uh, just so you know how I use some of those, um, some of that material is even when I meet with my assistant once a week and we're talking about all the tasks that need to be done, the first 15 minutes of our hour meeting, we're working through some of those, um, th that material to yeah. you know, yeah. how are you reaching out? Tell me about, yeah. tell me about any, um, you know, confrontation yeah. you've had yeah. that are, or that you've been able to share Jesus this past week yeah. or, so we have accountability that's yeah. built in as well. And, and I got to say, sometimes you'll hear pastors say things and you'll go, oh yeah, right. Sure. But you're, you're, you're Ron Burgundy. I don't believe you, right? But I can tell you, if you, if you come, and, and, and Ed, you've been here at Shoreland, you say you notice this in the culture. It's in the culture, not by chance. Yeah. It's in the culture because we infuse it every 30 days in every volunteer and staff member who has influence in our church. We're that committed to it. And we, and we have a process we take them through that just keeps it on the front burner of their heart and their life. And we are, we see people come to Jesus. We actually see people who are not travel, you know, travel from another church to visit us. I mean, people who are far from God, who put their faith in Jesus, who begin growing and they start reaching other people. It can happen. This is what God, this is the desire of Jesus. This is the heart of pastors and leaders, but it can happen, but it's not going to happen by accident. We have to partner with the spirit of God and we have to work hard at this because there's spiritual resistance. There's a war going on and the enemy pushes back and people are fearful and we've got to keep pushing through it. Amen. Amen. We can 
Absolutely sense that passion from you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sherry and Kevin. We're going to drop the assessment uh, that they talked about as well as some of their other free tools that they make available uh, here in the show notes. So uh, we've been talking to Kevin and Sherry Harney. You can learn more about them at kevinharney.com and sherryharney.com. Also, be sure to check out the book that we've been talking about, Organic Disciples, Seven Ways to Grow Spiritually and Naturally Share Jesus. Thanks again for listening to the Sessor Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. And again, if you found our conversation helpful today, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review. That'll help other ministry, uh, ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.